Good morning and, and welcome to our forum, uh, to lots of days of energy and time with each other to share and learn and to be challenged. And the nice thing about this first panel is we look to the next 15 years uh, and reflect on the depth of this multifaceted world that we live in and the complexity that face our perhaps most difficult time for some of the most vulnerable and those in chronic poverty. And we thought a good place to start this conversation was to tap one of the more distinguished academic thinkers uh, in our, our country and the world, Bill Easterly. He's a professor of economics at New York University and co-directs the NYU's Development Research Institute. And if you haven't tapped some of his books, Tyranny of Experts, I'm giving the short titles here, White Man's Burden, Exclusive Quest for Growth, he challenges our community to think ultimately what this is all about. And whether you agree with him, disagree with him, I think we should listen to him and see what he has to say to us. So I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Easterly to join me. Thank you very much. Uh, a few of you who might only know me as by a reputation as being a very harsh critic may not know that in real life I'm just a soft-spoken guy from Ohio. <laughs> I want to talk today about development, a big topic. Our prevailing approach to development is very, puts a lot of emphasis on technical solutions to the problems of the poor. I'm going to call this the technocratic approach to development that, that just stresses these technical solutions, which really do have a really appealing, uh, a really appealing logic as being very straightforward. They solve the problem. They're very tangible. You can imagine what's being financed. You can understand why they attract so much attention, why we, if we think about malnutrition, it seems so constructive to just talk about vitamin A capsules. If we're talking about malaria, it seems so constructive and to the point to just talk about spraying a chemical called pyrethrum on the walls of houses to kill the mosquitoes. If we're talking about uh, farmers' livelihoods, uh, maybe a better option than, than low-yield food crops is a forestry plantation that would give the, pro the farmers greater income. Let me illustrate why these technical solutions are not enough. On the morning of Sunday, February 28, 2010, the villagers in Mubende District, Uganda, were in church when they heard the sound of gunfire. They came out of church and found that men with guns were torching their homes, were burning their crops, were shooting their livestock. They kept them at gunpoint from rescuing their burning homes. There was an eight-year-old child who died in the fire. The farmers were marched off at gunpoint, 20,000 farmers in Mubende District, Uganda, and were told by the men with guns, this land is no longer yours. That's happened more than five years ago now. What's shocking about this example is that this was actually an IFC World Bank project that was converting the land to forestry. But of course, doing so without the consent of the landowners, the farmers who lived on the land. And the other shocking thing to me as a development observer when this story was going on was two non-events that happened after this. The first is that this, this story did appear, unlike many other forgotten rights of the poor, this story did appear on the front page of the New York Times. And so there was at least a momentary flurry of embarrassment for the World Bank. The World Bank promised to investigate. But the first non-event was that the World Bank never investigated its own role in this tragedy. And the second non-event, which I noticed as the author of a, a blog called Aid Watch at the time, uh, we wrote some blogs on this event when it was publicized, and it attracted very little passion or attention in the development community. We we're actually able to measure our clicks day by day on our blog posts, and I can tell you that one did not get a lot of clicks. So I then decided to write a book on this whole topic called The Tyranny of Experts, writing a book for a subject on which it appears there's no audience whatsoever. 
And so uh, still, I'm still trying, because now, I, now we pass the fifth anniversary. The World Bank has never been held to account for what happened in this tragedy. And why did not more people care? Now, rights are a moral end in themselves. Uh, what happened in this case was it, it violated the human rights, the political rights, the economic rights of the farmers Mubende. This violation is a bad thing in and of itself. So we don't need to justify rights as being of some material u utility for something else, for development, for poverty alleviation. They're, they are in themselves a worthy cause. We need new norms where we care enough about rights in themselves that there would be enough protest when there's such a major rights violation. But I have to confess at the same time I feel slightly embarrassed as an economist. I'm an academic economist. Why am I being so moralistic to talk about the violated rights of the poor? Why am I even talking about this subject as an economist? I feel sort of, it's sort of like an embarrassingly sentimental as if I was confessing that I cry at Hollywood romantic comedies, which I actually do, but. Um, um, so let me try to explain why an academic economist like me wound up uh, in this, in advocating rights. As economists, we think of all of our, our models, all of our theories about individuals making their own choices subject to their own budget constraints and choosing what's best for them. Implicit in that is that individuals do indeed have the right to choose, that they're not coerced, that they can freely choose what is best for them. And we really, really need that in order to be able, even to be able to say when any of our recommendations make poor, poor people better off that they have to have consented to what we recommended. That's a very obvious principle, but that's the one that economists have always been highlighting throughout the history of economics, and that's what's plainly violated in this story and much of the rest of technocratic development practice. So economists even have a you know, fancy jargon word for this with our usual genius for turning really obvious concepts into boring jargon, uh, revealed preference. If individual chooses option A over option B, we can infer that the individual is made better off by A compared to B. That B is better for the individual than B because the individual chose it. That's called revealed preference. I, I think you got it already like 10 minutes ago. Um, and when we go into an environment in which individuals are, are not free to choose, in which they are coerced, in fact, the inverse of revealed preference is that if the individual had to be coerced to choose option A over option B, they were probably made worse off because otherwise they would have freely chosen it and the coercion would not have been necessary. So that's why economists, I think, uh, at least some of us, have an obligation to talk about this core principle of consent, of freedom of choice. And I don't want to come across as sort of being self-righteous and saying, you know, this is the moral high ground and the other side is just you know, uh, I, I, we're so happy about rights violations, we're in favor of violating the rights of the poor. That's not the other side of the debate. The other side of the debate wonders whether this is useful to advocate this moral ideal of rights of the poor. Uh, they want action plans. They want action plans that make poverty better. And that's what I will engage in the remaining three and a half hours I have for this talk. <laughs> so let me give an, exa an example of this from uh, colonial times. So uh, let me, I'm running behind on my slides. Let me see the next slide. This was the Mubende, Uganda, after the tragedy. And then let me give an example from colonial times of similar technocratic approaches to development. So uh, the colonial regime, so in this Uganda story, in this Mubende story, there's a sort of complicated alliance of some Western powers, Western actors, Western supported actors like the World Bank. Uh, it's clear that part of what is going on in the Uganda story is that Museveni is an ally in the war on terror. Museveni gets a lot of foreign, US foreign aid as a reward for being an ally in the war on terror. And part of the pr political protection that both the World Bank and Museveni have is that the, the policy aims of the war on terror will protect the 
the autocrats that are useful in the war on terror. And so there's a sort of alliance of local oppressors, Western power, and Western-backed agents like the World Bank. And during colonial times, there's a sort of similar constellation, although of course much, much worse, that the, a, a foreign power was ruling Africans without their consent. The British colonial empire is the one I'm going to talk about. So in Uganda, for example, the British colonial empire gave, uh, also involved, through the practice of indirect rule, also involved local oppressors. They gave, in the Buganda agreement, they gave the chief the power to collect taxes, the power to draft one labor out of every three households as forced labor to build the roads. And uh, there's a lot of allegations the chiefs abused these powers to also use these forced laborers for their own purposes. And the colonialists also forced development schemes on the locals violating their freedom to choose. So for example, a British colonial directive on Uganda in 1925 went like this. The natives are to be informed that three courses are open to them, cotton, labor for the government, or labor for planters. They cannot be permitted to do nothing. Uh, perhaps this so much force was necessary because when they were doing nothing, they were actually growing high yield food crops and they actually knew much better than the British colonialists that high yield food crops were much better use of the land than cotton. But still, under this sort of oppressive regime of British colonial power and local, local oppressors, there was at that time also tremendous emphasis on technocratic solutions to poverty. Let me see the next slide, please. So here's a few solutions that we've already talked about that were already present in colonial times. This is a British, the first column is a colonial survey done under the British under a colonial official named Lord Haley. And the second column is a United Nations report that was done in 2005. Uh, so Lord Haley commissioned a, a huge amount of technical expertise, got hundred, no, literally hundreds of technical exports to come up with these technical solutions, which are exactly the same as what we talk about today. So I already talked about pyrethrum spraying the walls of the houses to kill the mosquitoes, already there in 1938. Vitamin A, already there in 1938. Uh, a couple other examples that were already there in 1938. So one, one simple lesson for this is that the poverty is not really about a shortage of technical solutions because the technical solutions have always been there. Poverty is not really about a shortage of experts. It's about a shortage of rights. Poverty is not really about a shortage of experts. It's about a shortage of rights. What was missing in this, in the British, under the British colonial regime was any sort of accountability of the British colonial power to the, what they called the natives that would have forced the British to actually have the incentive to implement some of these solutions or implement other solutions like uh, education and health measures for, the, for, the, for Africans that they were governing without their consent, uh, at which at the end of the colonial period, there was a disgraceful record on all of these things, the extent to which all these technical solutions had been actually implemented uh, and the education and health indicators were disgraceful at the end of the colonial regime. So the, the point that I'm going to get to here is that it's very simple that those in the colonial era who would have advocated technical solutions to poverty, they would have been right that these technical solutions would have ended poverty, but the technical solutions were not enough, just as they were not enough in the Mubenda Uganda story. The reason they were not enough is because the colonial, oppressive colonial power allied with oppressive local rulers had no incentive to do these solutions or other public goods like health and education. And so actually, it would have been a lot more constructive for everyone at this time to just advocate for an end to colonialism rather than advocate technical solutions. Any Western economist working in this development effort and the Lord Haley did justify the British Empire as a, as a development enterprise. Any Western economist working in this enterprise would have been better served just to say, colonialism is wrong. End colonialism because it's wrong. And in fact, they did, some, some did say that and eventually they were successful at ending colonialism. And that arguably was a lot more powerful for development in the long run than this stress on technical solutions. 
So that is the point that I'm making with this colonial era story. Things are, of course, a lot better today. We're not as racist or as colonialist, as condescending as we were in colonial times. But still, there's this huge emphasis, which we see in the second column, on the same technical solutions and the same neglect of the rights of the poor, the democratic rights of the poor, the rights of the poor to protest when governments violate their rights, when aid agencies themselves violate their rights. Now, the second uh, column was actually a United Nations report that was led by a Columbia University professor. I'm trying to remember his name. <laughs> Jeffrey Sachs. Um, he had a couple of other leading development economists working with him that I'll introduce in a moment in, in a following slide. Uh, and of course, there are many, many others that embrace this sort of technocratic approach to development and don't talk a lot about rights or even talk about rights in, in, in a, in the opposite, on the, from the opposite point of view. Uh, one of them is uh, a good, very good friend of mine, Bill Gates. A very good friend of mine was meant to be a joke, sorry, it didn't quite come across. Uh, so, speaking about another oppressive ruler, Bill Gates praised, uh, oh, I didn't mean Bill Gates, I was, sorry, uh, misunderstanding, please correct the transcript on that. Uh, uh, no, I meant Bill Gates was praising another oppressive ruler uh, that got a lot of Western support, and that was the Ethiopian government another ally of the US in the war on terror. Uh, Bill Gates praised the Ethiopian government for, quote, setting clear goals, quote, choosing an approach, measuring results, and then using those measurements to continually refine our approach. Gates said that this, quote, helps us to deliver tools and services to everybody who will benefit. Uh, you can't get more technocratic than that. That's so technocratic, it's an embarrassment to the other technocrats. It's just perfect for my, for my case. Uh, Gates's foundation has spent $265 million on health and development in Ethiopia over the last decade, during which he said he had a great working relationship with the Ethiopian autocrat during all of that time, Mele Sanawi, whose policies, he said, quote, have made real progress in helping the people of Ethiopia. Now, of course, once again, we have the same sort of constellation that uh, Ethiopia is getting a lot of US aid, a lot of World Bank aid. It's, uh, as I said, an ally in the war on terror. And so there's this sort of impunity with which both the supporters, the, the Western supporters of Ethiopia and Ethiopian autocrats themselves can get away with rights violations. Now, I don't have time to discuss it now. I believe that actually Gates was wrong in attributing progress to autocratic rulers of Ethiopia or pro attributing progress to autocrats in general. And this is a, a debate that I don't have time to talk about now, whether autocracy is really good or bad for development. I'm gonna argue the burden of, autocrats have failed to satisfy the burden of proof that if you give, give up your rights, we will deliver remarkable development progress. But I'm gonna continue to stress rights as an end in and of themselves, not, not needing to appeal to some material justification for rights. So what's said about this uh, example from Mr. Gates is that he's lending his voice to a worldwide debate on, on autocracy versus democracy that's, that's being fought around the world today from Hungary to Hong Kong to Turkey to all over Africa. And his, his voice is on the wrong side. Now, I wanna try to be as fair to him as possible, something I don't usually do, but let me try hard in this case. Um, he may think that he needs for his foundation to operate in Ethiopia to say nice things about the government of Ethiopia. I, I understand that. I, I understand these realities. Um, he didn't actually really need to praise the government of Ethiopia as being so wonderful um, as he does. Um, he could have just remained silent or stayed neutral. But most important is the sort of accidental equilibrium that, that, ha, that is occurring in our, in our field today that neglects rights and that does stress these technical solutions. Or someone like Mr. Gates is a huge voice in the whole development debate. So when he says, you know, I think Melis Hanawi is a great guy and is doing great things, uh, and unintentionally or not, he is participating in the big global debate on democracy and development on the wrong side. 
And that's the sort of accidental equilibrium that a lot of us, and I myself for most of my career, got, get caught in. And in our desire to do technical, these technical measures to support development, we unintentionally lend support to another uh, uh, that is actually against another big cause worldwide, the cause for democracy and human rights. So to give you just a final clinching example on Ethiopia, Ethiopia under Meles had yet another forced resettlement story just like the one in Uganda in which in the Gambela region of Ethiopia, there was a program named Villagization that forced farmers off their land at gunpoint. There were allegations of rapes, murders, there were refugees that fled to Kenya to escape this program. And one of these refugees named Mr. O even sued the British aid agency in, in court for supporting Melis's, supporting the Ethiopian government's forced resettlement schemes that had harmed these Ethiopian farmers so much. So clearly, once again, technocratic solutions are not enough and it, there is this unintentional tragedy that a lot of development voices and their zeal for technical solutions have wound up on the wrong side of the debate on the forgotten rights of the poor, the debate on human rights and democracy versus autocracy. Okay, so now we come to that point in the talk you've all been waiting for where the speaker gives their three po bullet points to solve the problem. Dramatic pause. What is my action plan to uh, advance rights? I think I actually forgot I have another slide before that, before I get to the action plan. I wanna give recognition to some of the people I've talked about, so. This was Lord Haley, the British colonial official who did so much to launch the whole technocratic approach to development. I think you know this man that I've been talking about. And then my favorite development economist, um, <laughs> who are supporting the technical solutions and never talk about rights, uh, I, they need no introduction. So what is my action plan to advance rights? That was, I sort of blew the, the whole setup for that, but I'm now ready to give you the action plan to advance rights. You're looking at it. This is it. It's blank. What? What did you want? <laughs> my, did you really think that my solution to having too many technocratic action plans was to give you another technocratic action plan? <laughs> no. I want to actually now start to argue that it's actually more useful to, I mean, obviously there are a lot of us who do need to talk about action plans. And there's a lot of great work that goes into action plans. That's great. I salute you, all of you who do action plans. But there's also a role for for some of the rest of us to do advocacy. And I now wanna kind of give you some, some thoughts on how advocacy is maybe better than action plans as an, as an option in moving development forward. Not, not always better, not universally better, not that we never do technocratic action plans full of very good technical solutions that really do sometimes work to alleviate a lot of suffering. Um, and I also wanna make clear that I'm not gonna advocate anything like some sort of utopian imposition of democracy on, on other countries, that there's some sort of quick shortcut that you can take, take some utopian leap for that, that we aid actors could even make that happen. I don't think aid conditionality on democracy is very likely to, to actually cause much constructive change. And I certainly don't believe in invading other countries to impose democracy on them. I think that's a crazy example. In general, I don't think the leading agents for change in this are even Western actors at all. I think the leading agents for change are, are African actors, are Asian actors, are Latin American actors. And the best we can do is be on their side and support them and not be against them. So why do, we, let, me, let me give you some indication of the sort of, maybe we've reached a saturation on already on action plans for development. There's so many action plans already. Uh, the World Bank thinks of itself certainly as a big generator of action plans. It calls itself the Knowledge Bank. Uh, yet there was a recent study by some World Bank authors that found that 31% of these World Bank knowledge products have never been downloaded. On the website, they're all the World Bank knowledge products. 31% have never been downloaded. 
Never. 87% have never been cited by anyone else. Now you understand my reluctance to give you a new action plan. And yet, uh, advocacy has, you could argue, it's, it's not easy, it's a long slog, but advocacy for rights has a much better record for causing social change in the long run. Advoc the history of rights suggests a powerful role for advocacy for social norms, for moral rights as an end in themselves. Advocates made progress by asserting that slavery was wrong, by asserting that colonialism was wrong, by asserting that unequal rights for, for women were wrong, that segregation was wrong. Martin Luther King did not say, I have an action plan. <laughs> so I think there's actually a lot to be said for advocacy uh, of changing the social norms and development of convincing more and more people that the indifference to the, more, the forgotten rights of the poor is something that needs to be corrected. Now this has been an unhappy story, but I want to end on an upbeat note. Uh, in their new book, uh, Africa Uprising, Adam Branch and Zachariah Mampili document more than 90 political protests in 40 African countries in the past decade. Democracy is being fought for all around the world. Democracy is already making gradual progress in Africa. Let me see the, the next slide, please. So in 1988, there'd only been two African countries classified as politically free by the advocacy organization Freedom House. In 2012, there are 11. In 1988, there were 31 really bad dictators in Freedom House's not free category. In 2012, the number had been reduced to 19. There's still a long ways to go, but here you see progress. So what, 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 what must we do indeed as, as development and aid people? And here I do want to, I guess, give you what is, sounds a little bit like an action plan. Uh, first and foremost, the point of this talk is we must not let the technical solutions to material poverty be an excuse to be silent about rights. Uh, we must not tolerate our own agencies directly violating poor people's rights as they did in the Mubende project in Uganda and the villagization project in Ethiopia. We must protest our own governments supporting for their own foreign policy reasons oppressive autocrats like Melis and Museveni that are propped up as allies on the war on terror. We must not let our ideas on solutions to poverty unintentionally support the autocratic side of the debate as, Bill, as I was arguing that Bill Gates unintentionally did by praising the autocratic rulers as being the solution to development when in fact they were the obstacle to development. So in summary, we, just, we simply must join the moral debate on the forgotten rights of the poor around the world. We must convince many more that all men and women, rich and poor, black and white, have the right to choose for themselves, have the right to consent, that all women and men, rich and poor, black and white, are created equal, that all women and men, rich and poor, black and white, deserve to be free at last, free at last, free at last. Thank you very much.